Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, you are here for this month's edition of Transit Screen Talks. Um, our topic today that we'll be covering is um, the planning for the future of mobility, um, understanding mobility score. And to that end, we've got Matt Kaywood, um, CEO of Transit Screen and mind behind mobility score. And we've also got Lisa Niesenson joining Hi. us today, um, founder of Alta Planning and Design and Greater Places. Lead of New Mobility. Lead, Lead of New Mobility. Yeah. Perfect. And founder of Greater, and founder Places. Of Greater Places. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So they're going to go ahead and launch into a presentation. I think they have a little intro for that as well. Um, and then after that, we'll be doing some Q&A. Um, so if at any point during the presentation you have questions um, that you want to have answered at the end, go ahead and fill them out in the question box and we will be sure to do so. Great. Thank you, Rachel. Okay. Um, Great. So, um, really excited to talk to everyone today about uh, uh, the future of mobility, um, the future of planning, mobility score, and uh, and how it can be used for planning. Um, so, just to give a little bit of background here, um, uh, Transit Screen. Uh, I founded it uh, uh, about uh, three, four years ago. And uh, we spun out of a uh, transportation man demand management program at Mobility Lab in Arlington, uh, Virginia, where we developed open source software. And then this is the uh, commercialization of that uh, in a way of getting um, real time transportation information, including all new forms of mobility, uh, uh, much more broadly distributed. This is one of our screens here in the DC area. Um, and the, you know the reason that I think um, Transit Screen, uh, you know, sort of became uh, how we've we've you know made progress where we have recently is because um, it's really on the, the the back of a wave of new mobility and a mobility revolution. Um, you know, if you just look at it uh, kind of from a, a very high level global view, uh, autonomous uh, mobility is taking off. There's tons and tons of companies uh, entering the fray. Uh, bike share itself has been just exploding globally. Um, in DC, we just got five new um, smart bike share systems uh, without docks uh, that showed up in the last month. Um, Car sharing continues to grow uh, in, in most markets as, as people uh, find that's a more affordable option than, than having their own mobility. Um, uh, and uh, ride sharing, of course, uh, the growth of, of Uber, Lyft, and, and global options really doesn't need any further uh, description. Um, mass transit itself, too, has, has grown tremendously in the last decade. And, and uh, you know, sometimes people don't appreciate this enough because, you know, if, in a U.S.-centric perspective, there aren't that many cities building huge amounts of mass transit. But, but globally, the number of mass transit systems in urban areas have basically doubled over the last 10 years, uh, which is a huge, huge change. So, um, you know, because of all these new options, people need the information to make decisions. And so, uh, you know, that's why we've found that uh, real-time public information screens uh, from our company ha have found places uh, in, in, you know, a lot of urban residential apartments, uh, places where people work, workplaces and office buildings, uh, hotels, hospitality sites, um, public spaces like this one outside the uh, stadium in DC. And so, you know, we've, we've grown our network uh, pretty quickly over the last uh, th three years and, you know, um, really not, not so much working with public agencies as just working with um, other uh, private stakeholders who have an interest in new in mobility. And, and these days, everyone seems to have an interest in mobility. So um, Lisa, uh, by way of introduction, we met each other through uh, 1776, uh, where, where we were in the kind of uh, tech incubator together, and she was doing Greater Places, and uh, I was launching Transit Screen. And so she comes from much more of a planning background, of course, so I'll let her talk about uh, that and, and, and about you know, how this relates to planning. All right. Well, thanks for joining, everyone, and hopefully we can give you um, a really good background in a new generation of tools for a new generation of transportation, and along with that, supporting infrastructure 
and land use. The one thing that we really want to emphasize is that with technology, having tools is great, but they mean nothing unless we give you applications to help you do your job faster, cheaper, and smarter. So we're going to talk a little bit about this tool and how we can actually better um, build something both from the policy platform side, which is planning, uh, and the tech platform side as well. Um, so first and foremost, uh, not everyone on the call is probably a uh, land use planner, so let me tell you what we do every day. Uh, traditionally, we do current planning, so we um, approve site plans. We do comprehensive planning, so that's uh, all of the different chapters, transportation, economic development, parks, parks and recreation, um, and transit. And then we work with the community. Like in this slide, you can see, we like building things with people, not for people. But with technology and disruption, there's two emerging jobs that are super important. One of them, we help communities manage change with all the disruption happening, but we also try and find solutions with multiple benefits, uh, just so that we can invest taxpayer and our private sector clients' dollars uh, more effectively. So why do we care about uh, shared use mobility? Well, first and foremost, land use, mobility, infrastructure are still interdependent. Um, and the same will hold true with autonomous uh, vehicles, whether there's a driver or not, these things always go together. Uh, we also seek uh, options with this better and new improved mobility. And then finally, uh, transportation is changing quickly. So we need to pay more attention to how active transportation transit and technology all work together to deliver better mobility. And of course, the final one is climate change. And I really don't need to tell you about recent headlines. Um, so why are we anxious about shared use? Well, first and foremost, you get anxious when anything's due or it poses uh, new skill sets needed for doing your job. Uh, but of course, there's also, we've seen early trends that show benefits uh, and on the flip side, early trends that show some risks and challenges that we have to meet. Um, and the job of the planner is to get ahead of it, to harness the benefits and limit the risks as much as we can through this uh, planning and civic outreach process. Process. Uh, in doing so, I wanted to give you just a little bit of a snapshot of the tools that we use. Um, and of course, in the um, good old days, at, these are still relevant actually, we look at crash data at intersections to see where uh, attention is most urgently needed. Uh, we can look at roadway and intersection assessments to see where's their congestion and clogging. Uh, a lot of times we use GIS to help us do that. Uh, we use travel forecasting models and travel demand, parking demand, those sorts of forward-looking tools, uh, and then network micro simulations just to see what might happen if we switch our planning uh, BMPs one way or another. So that's a, a, a traditional suite of tools, and you probably know of many others in transportation, economic development, and land use. Uh, with technology, though, we've got all these new real-time counts, location, and data feed. So if our old tools were either retrospective or uh, looking into the future, we're in a whole new world now where we can use real-time data to actually help make decisions uh, that can, in fact, uh, give us better land use and infrastructure, but it's a whole different ballgame here. Um, there are new parcel-based scenario tools. Uh, I want to point out one called urbanfootprint.io, uh, and it really takes some of the scenario planning down to the parcel-based uh, level. It's a platform, so it's being built to plug in, so I urge you to uh, look it up and do, look at the demo. And then finally, bus network redesign. There's a tech startup in San Francisco called Remix that lets you you analyze different bus route options. And then I just want to um, actually hearken on Matt's earlier slide about the growing new modes of transportation because it's even more complicated than that. Um, inside of these modes, there's variations on modes and each of them comes with their planning and infrastructure nuances. Um, so just looking at bicycles, sure, um, bicycling is on the rise and things like class four protected lanes have been a real boost to helping people move faster and feel safer. But even within bicycles, you've got 
e-bicycles, you've got shared bicycles, you've got cargo bikes, you've got electric bikes. And even within sharing, you have bikes at docks, you have bikes that, that are electric at docks. Um, and I'm just gonna stop there because it'll get exhausting. Um, but that's really a key to handing this off to Matt so that he can talk a little bit uh, about mobility score and all these nuances that we're gonna have to deal with in our daily jobs. Thanks, Lisa. So mobility score really came from the idea that at Transcurrent, we would collected a ton of mobility data, um, real-time and schedule-based uh, data for all these different mobility modes, uh, public transit, uh, shared modes, et cetera. And we were looking for a way to talk to people about mobility in a really simple way. Um, many of these people were, were like our, our real estate customers. And so rather than getting really in a deep dive, you know, where we're talking about all the different modes and how close they are and so on, we just thought, well, how, what if we gave them a, a score? And, you know, the, the approach of giving a score, like walk score, is a, is a popular model that does a similar sort of thing, uh, but focused on amenities and other neighborhood uh, factors as opposed to transportation. So, so we thought, well, let's let's do a, a simple score. Um, and so, what we, we came up with was a, a zero to hundred score that helps you understand your access to transportation choices. Um, and it's really focused on access uh, primarily, as opposed to you know demand or, or capacity or something like that. So, so it's it's one way of looking at the problem, um, but it's it's one that I think has a lot of relevance in this framework of, of rapid change. And um, the, the real advantage that I think Mobility Square has is, is um, because of the way it was developed, we have been able to make it um, compatible with almost every mode of transportation uh, that shared use or, or public. Um, so all uh, existing public transportation, subway, rail, bus, ferry, streetcar, uh, new mobility services, Uber, Lyft, uh, Via, chariot, microtransit, car sharing, bike sharing of all these varieties. Um, and it, it's also future proof in the sense that it works for all of these smart uh, dockless bike shares. Uh, we were just talking before about how we don't like dockless because it sounds like horseless carriage or something. You, you, you don't want to find it by what, it, what it's not. You want to find out what it is, which is a, a smarter bike share, I think. Um, and then uh, self-driving cars and, and other autonomous sort of services. Um, and so, so really, um, the way that that, that works, the, the, that we can make it future compatible, is by focusing on a common currency of time. And, and you know, in a technical sense, this is out of vehicle time. A simpler way to, to, to just talk about it is it's the time it takes you to walk to access this transportation, plus the time you wait for it there, plus the time it takes you to board it or, or start it up and get going or, or whatever, you know. So you could imagine um, it works for all, all, all of these different forms we talked about. You'd probably even do it for historical forms like, you know, shared horses or something like that if, uh, if you wanted to. So, um, this makes it a very powerful and broadly useful framework. Um, specifically to public transit, um, there are a lot of tools you know, that exist for, for understanding transit networks. Um, and one, one common way of thinking about those is, is, is in terms of service frequency. How many trains do you get or buses do you get per hour? And uh, a nice thing about mobility score is that the transit component of it is, is all based on that kind of service frequency. So, mm -hmm. so your, your um, number of, of points you get, the number of kind of mobility score points you get from, from a transit line. Uh, if you're standing right on the station platform, it's it's basically the, the number of trains per hour you get. So that's that's a kind of nice uh, property and it gives you some nice consistency across different modes. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there's some other details. I don't want to get really, you know, deep into it. I mean, for car share and bike share, we, we actually model um, people's search behavior in terms of going to the nearest car share or bike share at any available time of day. So it, it's based on real time data that's collected based on, um, you know, what's in service and what's out of service. Uh, if there are no bikes, then that doesn't contribute to mobility score and, and so on. Um, and it's averaged over the whole week. So uh, we look at mobility uh, generally from a 24 hours, seven days a week kind of perspective uh, in this analysis, um, which is not to say we could do other things. That's just what we're doing right now. So um, the last thing I want to mention is that it's it's very address and location specific. So so uh, you can go to our website and get a mobility score for a single address and um, or a single latitude longitude, and it will change on a uh, you know sub block level, which I think makes it interesting because there's spatial variation, but it's also relevant because we know that those walk times, you know, make a difference. I'm more likely to take a bike share if it's right outside my building as opposed to if it's a block down or two blocks down, you know, so, so being able to capture that, I think, is, is, is part of the power of Mobility Score. And um, so I would encourage you to all, all, all try it out um, after the seminar. 
uh, <laughs> you can go to mobilityscore.us. Um, we like to say us uh, that rather than US because it's actually in US and Canada and, and we're gonna take it um, more broadly soon. Okay. Um, so, uh, but the, uh, the, the, the gist of what you get here um, from Mobility Score is you, you click on the, on the map or you type in your address and uh, you'll get a, uh, a map showing some, some travel sheds. Uh, these are approximately uh, sort of five and 10 minute walk sheds. Uh, and, and we actually use real walk times for all the, the Mobility Score analysis so that the, the circles on a map are just, just indicative. Um, the, and that shows you all the different services that are contributory to Mobility Score in this case. Um, so several bike share stations are contributing, uh, all these different uh, transit lines, and so on. And we, we keep we're, we're continuing to iterate on this interface just to to, to show you what's what's um, currently available. This is this is the public facing you know website, and, and we're also looking at making other additional data products available. Um, you can see the overall mobility score for this site, which is the office where we're sitting right now in, in DC, is 98. Uh, that's considered excellent mobility. And um, the breakdown table on the right shows kind of what percentage of the 98 is comes from these different um, modes. So 65% of the um, access to mobility here is, is based on public transit, 13% ride hailing, that's Uber and Lyft, 13% uh, bike sharing, and then 9% uh, uh, car sharing. So, uh, you know, as, as new mobility modes come in, as we add some more smart bike systems to this system, the bike share fraction will, will increase a little bit. And so you can, you know, imagine comparing before and after and seeing, seeing what, you know, how it affects the city and how it affects a particular site. Um, one thing we're doing, and this is probably less relevant to a planning audience, but I, I wanted to mention it anyway. Um, we're going to be working with a lot of different uh, uh, companies to put Mobility Score badges on a website um, to really facilitate this kind of easy decision making. So if you're imagining that you're looking at a hotel in a city that, that you don't travel to or, a, or Airbnb or a, um, looking at an apartment to rent, uh, you, could, you can you know, make a sort of initial assessment based on a mobility score um, and, and just say, you know, I'm in, going to San Diego, would I rather stay in someplace that has a mobility score of 85 or a place that has a mobility score of 58, you know? So um, that's, that we think that's gonna be helpful and so you can start seeing that on, on a bunch of websites um, starting as soon as next month. Um, and we're currently, as I mentioned, in the top 65 uh, MSAs in the U.S. and Canada. Um, and by, by next month, we're going to be in all, all the U.S. and Canada. So, you know, every, every community that has um, open data, open transit data in particular, uh, is going to be part of Mobility Score. So, um, you know, we're, we're actively adding that right now. Um, and if, if, if you're out there and you'd like us to, to add your data um, and, and it's not available uh, on the web yet, please, uh, please drop us a line. All right, so now we're gonna get into the nitty gritty of how we might use this. And uh, Matt and I sat and brainstormed these uh, top nine different use cases, and we'd love to get yours. Um, certainly, we could use this to identify shared use congestion points, but also mobility deserts. Uh, even in New York City, where you think there's a richness, there are areas that really don't have a multitude of services, especially shared use. Um, we, you can look at time of day or monthly variations. You can look into predictive modeling, uh, so that something with a network redesign or how and where you put a mobility hub, for example. Matt talked a little bit about historical baselines. Um, you can look and compare with other data sets. So maybe you can compare it to areas with car ownership. Uh, you can look at corporate relocation so that if you are either being relocated or you're a professional, uh, you have that at your fingertips because uh, living and working around transit uh, stations is a very, very popular thing with, with your workforce. Um, we also uh, are looking at things like tourism and economic development. So Matt mentioned Airbnb. Wouldn't it nice be nice to have this? Um, so you can judge as you're comparing properties. Uh, site plan review is another one. So anyone out there who's a planner uh, and is looking at either one or numerous sites uh, together in a planning area, you might be able to make better decisions on design, placement, siding, and size. And then, of course, we would love you right now to jot down the other ways that you are thinking of uh, to be able to use this. Um, so now we're going to look into discrete 
techniques and how you can use this. So for example, as a planner, if you notice that you have congestion, uh, you might be able to actually do some short-term signage and management and uh, enforcement. The other picture here is, um, we're very big at Alta in um, piloting and testing, even with land use. And this uh, shows a quick mock-up of how you might be able to take a one block stretch and actually figure out where you need to place things so that they're not in conflict with each other or so that your travelers can make seamless transfers. Um, I even think there should be a transit screen in this somewhere um, and other smart city technology to test. But that is the name of the game now um, for almost everything is, is to build a pilot and test it and then improve it before you actually sink a lot of taxpayer money into something that's gonna uh, be very difficult to rip out. One of my favorite, uh, oh sorry, just to comment, one of my favorite uh, phrases in transportation is, is the one, I can't say it because it's in German, but it's the one about you know uh, planning before information before concrete. Oh. So it's a it's hundred times cheaper to plan first and then uh, right. 10 times cheaper to fix it with information technology. And then, <laughs> then by the time you're actually pouring concrete, you're, you're in a world of hurt. So, yeah. Um, you know, I think I think the bottom line is like something like mobility score could be used to to help mm -hmm. plan the Absolutely. siting of these things, and then you know, to once you get to that the actual sort of you know looking at managing conflicts and stuff like that, that's where you need the services of of you know professional planners to you know think through all of these scenarios exactly. and all of these aspects. Um, and People for Bikes actually does have a guide called Quick Build for Streets, and I highly recommend it. Um, also infrastructure uh, investment. So how can a uh, mobility score be used to help you decide where uh, you should put some of those um, improvements for bike lanes? Uh, on the right, this is a really interesting new project uh, that we're doing in the Coachella Valley called the CV Link. It is actually a transportation corridor that supports mixed modes. So it's uh, jogging and walking, it's bicycling, and it's also low speed electric. And I think we need to actually pay a lot of attention to this as more and more modes become low speed electrified, whether it's a one wheel or a skateboard or scooter share uh, or these neighborhood electric vehicles. Um, again, designing conflict out at the very beginning is going to be uh, our job. Um, it will not ever replace that 100% recreational trail. So uh, I just want to put a fine point on that. Uh, then, of course, bike share expansion. Um, these new systems are beginning to actually grow the local appetite for biking and bike share and actually starting to loosen some of the anxiety and opposition that some people have, in particular with e-bikes and e-bike share. Um, we also think that for a lot of these uh, smart bike share that, that don't have their docks, there's going to be an incredibly big demand for more bicycle parking, whether it's owned or shared uh, or cargo delivery as e-commerce actually puts more stuff on the streets in cargo bikes. And UPS actually just yesterday announced their new um, human powered delivery uh, in Canada. So. Uh, we are already seeing pressure on the conventional ways that we design these facilities. Uh, then, of course, Matt mentioned bus network redesign. So you can use mobility score to actually look at this because the most sensitive part about redesigning a bus network is that there will be some riders who will lose the service close to their house um, or that they're used to. And how can shared use mobility actually help fill some of those gaps or at least inform you where maybe you shouldn't redesign in an area of low mobility. Uh, so uh, that, that again is very, very, important. And then as part of the uh, planning process, uh, how can you use the information that you get? Uh, for example, on spin, here's, here's a heat map of where people are dropping the bikes. Um, that, of course, can tell you a lot uh, about the landscape and where you've got demand for more biking. And then the last thing I want to talk about the planning process. Um, for transportation planning and land use, we do a lot of feasibility analysis. Um, so, for example, if you're looking at a docked bike share system, well, the feasibility analysis for the dock less is going to be different than for the docked. And this is a way to get real-time information um, so that 
that feasibility is a lot more transparent than with some of the other tools and methods that we've used in the past. Um, and then part of the site plan pro planning process, uh, this is from the Sprawl Retrofit Guide, and it shows how you can actually put liner buildings on a street frontage so you can incrementally uh, bring new development to suburban areas and exurban areas. But one of the things uh, that is going to come into play is where do you put the Uber and Lyft pickup and drop off? Uh, you've got to put it so that it is actually uh, convenient, but you've also got to put it in areas where uh, you're not going to put people in harm's way um, or make it so inconvenient that they're not going to use Uber or Lyft anyway and just drive their own car. Another thing too on that, on that slide is the importance of, of uh, having good quality pedestrian links also right. in, in a place like that. Um, you know, or some of these new development areas like, you know, Tyson's Corner, D.C., where they brought in uh, transit-oriented development, but right. the pedestrian links aren't, aren't that great yet. And, and so, you know, um, really uh, it, access to mobility, to maximize that, you really need to find ways to minimize the walk time or else, you know, people will, will find other ways of travel. Right. Um, and then there's other things, too. Uh, we've seen a lot of proposals that perhaps in order to uh, replace the gas tax and some of the lost revenue, um, we've seen in Chicago where there are actually fees put on Uber and Lyft to help fill the general fund. I think in general, um, a lot of these fees are way more popular and easier to sell if the proceeds are actually reinvested back into the service area so that you could possibly um, have a surcharge for someone who wants door-to-door -door convenient but they're blocking traffic to be a little bit higher than uh, people who p choose to walk maybe another uh, 50 feet for a coordinated pickup and drop-off area that won't cause congestion. And speaking of Chicago, which is uh, which is my hometown, um, here's a slide. Um, this is from the Chicago Tribune, uh, showing that uh, in the last decade, also 50 major Chicago area corporations relocated downtown. So we were talking earlier about corporate relocation and site selection being a, a major um, uh, point of, of interest uh, for for a lot of people. Um, you know, these are all, all these companies are, are ones you've probably heard of, and they're not just you know tech companies or companies that are just hiring you know people at age twenty to twenty five. You know, like like these are these are major you know companies in mature industries that all relocated downtown, and so um, you know there's there's been a massive trend uh, you know around the U.S. and and, and broader as well. Um, so you know when people look at this um, you know this kind of relocation, um, you know, there was recently a lot of excitement uh, about. Uh, one company's relocation, um, which was <laughs> partly uh, based on uh, the fact that they had essentially maxed out transportation links in their uh, hometown of Seattle. And so uh, Amazon uh, put their headquarters, HQ2, uh, up for, for uh, bids, essentially proposals. Um, and um, uh, the, we're, we're a DC-based tech company, so the um, uh, the DC mayor's office called on us to uh, assist with with their uh, bid construction and analyze, do some analysis of the um, uh, the different sites that they'd pick, and they picked four different sites in DC uh, as being ones that could could supply the necessary eight million <laughs> square feet of, of office space. Um, and um, so we we did a predictive model. Um, using mobility score or what we call mobility score pro internally. Um, and, and so we, we took, you know, what we know about Amazon Seattle campus in terms of the kind of scale of their transportation operation broadly, the, um, you know, the idea that you can do some certain improvements very tactically like place bike share and car share and, and, and shuttles and, and other, you know, attract other mobility modes. Um, and so we did some modeling to show how that would uh, play out at sort of phase one, the initial, um, 500,000 square foot, you know, very large building. Uh, and then at, at the next phases, also what kind of range of scenarios would be um, for the full build out. And so this map here shows the four different uh, uh, study areas. Um, and, and, you know, the, I think the, the message that I would uh, take home from this is that the, um, so I, I should have put a color scale on it. It's like uh, 60 to, to 90 mobility score essentially um, is 60 is yellow, 90 is is uh, dark red, and so um, you know the, the the sites have very different uh, characteristics from from one to the other. There's the one at RFK Stadium, which is very uh, towards the right. That's even hard to see. Um, you can see it right there. Yep, exactly. Um, but the um, 
there, there's a lot of spatial variation and it depends on metro, but it also depends on, on bus access and, and other things. So in Anacostia, in the southernmost part, uh, a lot of that's not actually driven by metro access. There is a metro there, but th there's metro in the other places too. Um, there's just particularly good um, sort of bus density there. So all of these things are, can you know, inform the kind of site selection and, and expansion decision. Um, and, and you know, I think um, one other analysis we did here was um, looking a little more closely at existing modes um, and, and then maybe some prospective uh, modes as well here. And so this was everything that was in the a one mile radius of the Navy Yard Anacostia uh, uh, proposed site. Um, so you can see there's, there's kind of two subway lines within, within the, the uh, walk time uh, shed as well as a lot of other options. And so, um, you know, we went around sort of dropping some new ones in and kind of seeing how that affected um, uh, mobility for uh, a company that uh, was had a very strong interest in making sure that uh, the, the transportation system would continue to function at full build out. All right, and then we're going to uh, round out the presentation uh, with just a talk about how you can begin to coordinate the land use planning and infrastructure uh, with a lot of these emerging, growing, trending, and even future modes like uh, autonomous shuttles. Uh, this we drew just to give you a sense of all of the different interlinking parts. So if you're not a land use planner, um, I hope you will start to feel more sorry for those of us who are, um, because our job is, is pretty complex. Um, Hubs can have various topologies that can go from very simple, where it's just a bike share co-located with a bus stop or maybe some different amenities, uh, to something very complex. And this is from San Diego forward. Uh, and this actually does a really good job of showing you all of those interlinking parts in a graphic. Um, so again, uh, the smart city plus the active plus the transit, plus the shared use, uh, plus the autonomous, and I guess there should be a drone in here somewhere, um, but all of these different supportive pieces of infrastructure. And again, like Matt was saying, if the currency is time, how do you make all of this close together and seamless, but also delightful? That's what people are looking for. Um, sorry about the blurriness here. Um, you can also have hubs in suburban areas uh, where maybe you are using a commuter bus hub, but you can begin to add a lot of different options. And then finally, let's just talk. Um, I uh, am at Alta and we have a lot of different services we can offer. And then um, right now in beta on Android, there's the Greater Places, which is all one word app, and I'd love for you to check it out uh, and get in touch with me and tell, you, t tell me a little bit more about what you need as a planner and how we can connect you with the people doing the work, like Matt here, who's created a great tool. So we look forward to your questions. Awesome, yeah. Um, so let's go ahead and see um, what kind of questions we've got from our audience here. All right. Ooh. We have a question from Ben. Um, do you have plans to roll out sidewalk and crosswalk access in the score in the future? Um, so I, I, I think um, my, my understanding, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is, okay. that, is that we're talking about um, the quality of, of the transportation network, whether it's a pedestrian network right. or, or um, and we have also, I've also gotten questions from a couple people about um, assessing the quality of, of the bike network mm -hmm. um, locally to that. And um, I, that's definitely something we're looking at. Um, you know, I think um, the, the way that, there are a couple ways you can see it. One way is, is you know, just purely, you know, do the sidewalks and crosswalks exist uh, and, and how does that shorten walk time? Because if you're in some, you know, suburban site on some, some huge strode and there's no way to cross it for a nice. mile in either direction, then, then that will definitely affect mobility score because you know, mobility score assumes that you're crossing at, <laughs> you know, marked designated crossings. Um, as far as, um, you know, being able to, to sort of assess like a layer of, of, of that data, then, then, you know, I think, um, you know, there's various uh, open street map and some other, other kind of data sets that would do that. And then, um, you know, in, in terms of kind of assessing how that affects demand for, for mobility, 
Um, I, that's, that's I think, a, a deeper question and, and one we're, we're thinking about. i um, love to talk. Uh, you can shoot me an email uh, on the follow-up email after, after this. Um, yes, and I'd love to answer that question. So I just did a course on first last mile access to transit. Uh, and it, it, Benjamin is asking the question that also gets to some of the criticisms of walk score in that it can have a high walk score, but absolutely horrendous um, access and infrastructure. Uh, and to a large degree, some of that is a little bit hard to capture, even though I can see doing it as part of a station area master plan, um, because you are working with such a um, really concentrated geographic area. I think the other challenge in all of this is a lot of that access to transit and infrastructure um, experience is subjective. So it may be from a very objective and nerdy and engineering standpoint, fine, but there can be those very subtle cues that make it feel unsafe um, or, or inconsistent. And so to that end, some of it can be actually mapped into and, and used, but some of it's just going to be um, just gumshoe going out there <laughs> all the different time um, and making sure that that infrastructure does what it has to do. I mean, I'd, lo I'd love to see, and this is maybe a little more speculative, but ways to, to, to tie in sort of real-time travel data, right. you know, for, for some of these things. Um, you know, if you look at the, you know, people's sort of readiness to, to, to use bike infrastructure, right. um, you know, I think that's something that can be, can be tracked using, you know, um, high-resolution uh, data, um, you know, whether people are biking on the street or on the sidewalk as right. well as surveys. Well, and giving a score to something like a class four protected bike lane versus a Shero or a street tattoo. <laughs> awesome. Um, how important do you think the affordability of a transit mode is to the planning process or calculating the mobility of an area? I think that's, um, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think, um, we, we've, we've put some thought into that, um, you know, because mobility score at, at sort of initial launch is really focused on, on time and, and, you know, convenience uh, of access. Um, but from, from my perspective, like cost is, is, is obviously an issue. It's, it's, a, it's a, you know, regulatory sort of statutory issue. It's, a, um, it's, it's also just an issue in terms of practicality, like certain modes are gonna work for commuters you know, it better because they, you know, they have a predictable cost. Um, so the way that, that we're going to approach this with mobility score is um, essentially the current mobility score is, is the maximum mobility score if you're essentially indifferent to cost, mm -hmm. um, you know, barring crazy travel modes like helicopters. Um, and then as you change uh, the variable of, of cost, you know, basically what, what, people's tolerances for cost per mile or, or you know, similar metrics, uh, trip cost, um, you, can, you can see how mobility score increases up to the maximum uh, based on that. And, and I, I, my, my hunch, and we, we haven't explored this in depth yet, I, this is something I'm, I'm interested in, is, is figuring out you know, how quickly the mobility score rises with people's, uh, you know, and how that correlates to affordability, will tell you something about uh, commitment to sort of, you know, broader uh, affordable access to transportation in an area. Um, certainly, it'll show differences between, like, a, you know, a, a New York that has flat transit fares, you know, or independent of distance compared to a place like DC where you pay a lot depending on distance. Right, and from someone who uh, is deep into bike and ped planning. Um, my selfish interest is to have shared use mobility, especially bike share, boost the overall demand for uh, infrastructure for everyone, even individual walking and biking, because there is nothing cheaper than being able to walk and bike to the destinations you need to go. So I think it's, it is that one thing that lifts everything. Um, no pun intended. <laughs> Uh, speaking of, um, okay. we've got another question. How is ride hailing um, or TNC access quantified? Does it become a self-fulfilling prophecy um, where TNC is flocked to dense urban car light areas instead of suburban areas um, where owned car access could transition to rented TNC or autonomous vehicle use? Um, that's, that's a very, yeah, that's an interesting question as well. I mean, I think 
the, the way that we currently measure our ride hailing TNC access is, is essentially based on arrival times. Uh, and, and right now we have a, a geographical model of that, that that takes into account some assumptions about kind of urban geography. Um, we're working to, to get data partnerships that would allow us to, to, to look at it in, in, in more detail um, on a sort of aggregated basis. Um, and I think that, um, you know, that basically, I don't think it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because I, I think that there are some diminishing returns mm -hmm. to packing uh, ride hailing into, into particularly dense corridors. Um, right. at, at some point that, that, that particular, you know, number, you know, two minutes away average or something, you know, doesn't really change anymore. You know, you can't get it below one minute or you can't get it and get it to zero. Um, and so, if you're looking at it from an access to mobility perspective, you know, and, and using mobility score as a tool, then you are going to get C returns in, in, in other areas. Now, you know, if you're looking as the TNCs and companies do for you know, demand and trying to sort of forecast demand for the service, then you might end up with, with more, more clustering. But I think this is, this is you know, the, the tension where I think mobility score could be a, a a tool that planners could use to say, you know, we need we need to improve the, the sort of uh, access to ride hailing in, in this area, mm -hmm. you know, and, and facilitate car free behavior. Whereas, you know, the mobility uh, the, the TNCs might might prefer to sort of cherry pick certain customers or something like that. Right, right, right. Um, and I almost see some of the affordability and this question going a little bit hand in hand. Um, and a couple of points is that. So if you've got a dense urban area and you look at your phone and your um, Uber or Lyft is coming in, say, 10 minutes, you're like, what the hell? Um, but if you're in a suburban area, it's like, wow, that's great. Just because the relative times that, that transportation eats of your time budget um, are a little bit different. Um, I also think that um, with the gig economy, it's not just in cities, it's everywhere. And so there will be... Um, people in suburban ex urban areas who find this as a way to, to be their income or supplement their income. Um, I just read something super interesting about how autonomous shuttles will probably be first adopted in suburban areas, not urban areas, just because you've got to have the simplest Petri dish you possibly can. And a lot of these um, malls that need redeveloping offer a great opportunity to do that and that's where you may see some of these fleets and, and things happening sooner than later but you're right it boils down to what your pricing toolkit is um so so that is an interest that's a whole different webinar <laughs> so. awesome um and i think we're about to wrap up so let's close out with um one last question um i know you mentioned you know eight or nine possible applications, but is mm -hmm. there any one application of mobility score you're most excited about? I mean, I, I think from, from my perspective, what I'm, I'm really interested in is, is, is seeing how we can um, use tool like mobility score to inform uh, land use. Because uh, right now, all over the country, there are, there are tons and tons of um, decisions being made about about land use specifically often about parking parking minimums and and, and so on um, where you know developers are saying look we see that mobility is changing we don't want to build a parking garage it's not going to pay right. off it's never going to pay off it's you know this is all we're just pouring concrete money down a hole and and so the problem right now with these negotiations between uh, you know developers and the cities um, mm -hmm. who, who often you know want to uh, build less parking but maybe are worried about public buy-in or maybe are worried about some some statutory you know thing that, that their, their uh, regulations they have to follow is that there's not a lot of transparency on, on both sides and there's mm -hmm. the, the, you know I think you can have more right. productive conversation in these kinds of land use discussions if everyone's coming to the table with the same kind of framework, something like mobility score or future version of mobility score, mm -hmm. where you can say, here's the mobility access at this site right now. Here's what we think it's gonna look like in a couple of years. Do we really need that parking? Probably not. So I, I'd love to see that accelerate the pace of kind of land use change in cities and accelerate some of the positive impacts of, of new mobility in terms of you know greenhouse gases and congestion and everything else. That, that's that's my take on it. 
uh, hands down, it's uh, whether or not we are equally providing shared use options uh, to everyone. Uh, and so it brings transparency to the industry as well. Um, and if it's not, then that gives us an opportunity to go into different neighborhoods to see why are there gaps. Um, sometimes it's going to be service, but sometimes it's just customer adoption of someone who's wary um, about this being a first step towards gentrification, or um, they're just not used to something like this, or maybe they don't have a smartphone. Um, but it, it's real-time data that can give us a deeper dive, and we can start testing things that work or don't work, um, so that shared and shared mobility is you know true to its word so awesome um well thank you everybody um matt and lisa thank you for your time and, and your thoughts um and thank you for everybody for taking time out of your day um to join us we'll be sending a follow-up email um that has a a link to everything we talked about here so the presentation slides will be on that um and and some contact information if you have any questions that come up or, or thoughts that you want to share and we look forward to hearing from you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, thank you.